Chapter Six of Things Seen in Venice by Lonsdale and Laura Rag. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fasts and Festivals. Early in the nineteenth century, a great Venetian lady wrote the story of the Feste Veneziane. Her family had given doges to the Republic, and she had been bred among the pomps and shows of an age when the city, dead indeed at the heart, yet retained the semblances of freedom. She wrote with sadness, for Napoleon had descended upon Venice, and Attila, as he said, for the oligarchy falsely labelled a republic, and the ancient festivals had died with the government which had created them. Yet she knew that her task was no frivolous pastime, nor piece of dry antiquarian research, that a gorgeous pattern of ceremony was interwoven with the very fabric of Venetian history, and must be examined by every student. Thus the word-pictures of Justine Aregne and Michiel take their place beside the paintings, in which Carpaccio and the Bellini show us the pageantry of their day. The old order has changed. The close union between church and state, a remarkable feature in Venetian history, is broken, and civil and ecclesiastical authorities no longer conspire to maintain religion and patriotism by a recurrent series of commemorative festivals. Modern Venice, free once more, but with the larger freedom of united Italy, closes her shops on the day of the Statuta and on the famous Venti Settembre, September the 20th, but has not, of course, resumed the festivals which proclaimed her former independence, while many minor ecclesiastical and parochial celebrations have been abolished or curtailed, not by the civic authorities, but by the present Pope, when Patriarch of Venice, on account of the irreverent disorders they engendered. But the Venetians still exhibit the fusion of two qualities often opposed in other races and individuals, strong tender feeling, and a passion for sumptuous display. Therefore they still remain a festa-loving people, and even now punctuate their calendar with observances new and strange to the northern visitor, and apt to remain in his memory as among the most interesting of the things seen in Venice. Let us begin with a Christmas Eve visit to the fair on the Rialto Bridge, where booths are erected for the purveyance of cheap dainties, cheap finery, cheap articles of daily use, things appealing not to the rich, who can go to the shops in the Merceria, but to the poor who may have a few pence to spare when the Christmas marketing is done. Sometimes on these stalls the writer has found little pieces of Venetian glass at the lowest of prices. They have some slight flaw, a tiny moulding is chipped, a dragon or seahorse has come out imperfect from the fire, or a vase, exquisite in shape, does not hold water. So, after brief bargaining, they may be bought for a quarter of the usual retail price. Lower down in the market there is abundance of provisions and a gay throng of buyers. The stalls where geese, turkeys and capons are sold are scenes of lively, characteristic bargaining. Flowers from the Riviera are plentiful, and little Christmas trees are attracting the attention of many a pater familias. In the early morning hours, the vendors of fish do a roaring trade, for Christmas Eve is a vigil strictly observed, and by midday the fish market is almost depleted. Towards six in the evening, the human tide sets towards St. Mark's, for there, by a unique use, the first mass of Christmas Day is celebrated about half-past six on Christmas Eve. Doubtless this use dates from an ancient method of beginning the day at the hour of the evening Ave Maria. Half-past six on Christmas Eve would, by this reckoning, be the first hour of Christmas Day. The Venetians continue to use this style of counting till the Napoleonic conquest. I say advisedly about, for in Venice a great vagueness prevails as to the time of any function, and a given hour is customarily announced with a qualifying circa about. This Christmas Mass is one of the most beautiful services of the year. The sole lighting of the nave is the soft radiance streaming from a great suspended cross of beaten iron, the frame of which supports vast numbers of primitive lamps, mere glasses filled with an oil in which are floats and wicks. But the high altar is ablaze with candles, 
and gleaming with the solid gold of the Pala d'Oro. The body of the church is packed with standing worshippers of every age and class. Privileged persons and early comers find seats in the chancel facing the altar. The choir stalls are filled with the canons of St. Mark's in their ermine tippets. The patriarch is the celebrant. Then from somewhere on high in the dim vault of the dome comes an outburst of song, the thrilling, imperative summons of the Adeste Fideles. The music usually heard in St. Mark's is not very remarkable, and Venetian voices, affected doubtless by sea mists and northerly winds, have a very different timbre from the liquid, sonorous tones of southern throats. But the disposition of the singers in a gallery to the left above the chancel, entirely hidden from the nave, joined with the marvellous effects of light and colour in the wonderful building, produce an indescribable impression upon the worshipper on Christmas Eve. The function ended, the Venetian begins to greet his acquaintance long before he leaves the church. Then he probably takes a turn or two in the piazza, after which he goes home to sup on a maigre soup, a little fish, a vegetable, some mostarda, and some almond nougat. These latter are his mince pies and plum pudding, the distinctive plat of the Christmas season. Mostarda is a delicious apple sauce sometimes mixed with candied fruits and always flavoured with warm and pungent spices the nougat is made with honey and is rather nauseating in its sweetness once upon a time the venetians went a-masking whenever they chose throughout the period of carnival that is from epiphany to ash wednesday a scrap of white satin or black velvet on the face with a black hood over head and shoulders abolished all social convenance, all class distinctions, and the mask was generally held to be the finest commodity in the world. Now, save for sporadic bands of children sporting on Sunday in the piazza, Sio Mascara rarely shows himself before Shrove Tuesday. That evening, all Venice is abroad, a band plays, and there is often dancing on the piazza. The crowd is wonderfully good-tempered, quiet and decorous. Two or three ladies together can walk about in mask and domino without the slightest risk of annoyance, and not a few do so, seeking out their friends, speaking in squeaky assumed voices, and showing as much acquaintance as possible with their victims' little weaknesses. Supper parties are held in the restaurants. Friends meet and smoke in the cafes on the piazza, and about eleven, the veglioni begins at one of the theatres. Venetian ladies do not as a rule attend this masked ball, unless perhaps a party is made up for a spree, and then they are spectators rather than dancers. On the other hand, the cavalchina, the bal masque held at the Fenice, the Venetian opera house, on one of the last nights of carnival, is always under patrician patronage. It is for beneficenza, the proceeds being divided among the principal charitable institutions of the city. Individuals and trading companies offer prizes for the best costumes. The owners of boxes relinquish their rights in them for the night, and they are resold for fancy prices by the managing committee. The spectacle, as viewed from the boxes, is very diverting, though greatly marked by the licence allowed to male dancers to appear in ugly modern morning dress, not even in flack, and to walk about in bowler hats such a false note in the spectacle jars the more because of the dainty loveliness of the background the fenice cannot compare in size or magnificence with the scala at milan or the san carlo at naples but its unaltered eighteenth-century decorations give it a peculiar cachet of its own even on an ordinary opera night one feels that powdered heads and patched faces ought to look forth from the boxes and that when a door opens at the back to admit a visitor, one should catch a glimpse of a periwig, cocked hat and sword. During the carnival of 1907, one was able to realise the aspect of the house in the days of its glory, for, as part of the celebration of the Goldoni Bicentenary, it was decided that fancy dresses at the Cavalchina should all be of the Goldoni period, and that even non-dancers should appear poudrés. 
dancers with a box use it as a sort of private sitting out room into which however their masked acquaintance are apt to intrude sometimes the visitor uses his disguise to pay off old scores or as a long-sought means of love-making sometimes he is recognised amid a chorus of derisive laughter sometimes he leaves his friends intrigue and embarrassed and always there is an atmosphere of piquant unreality of utter irresponsibility and one experiences again the forgotten sensations of childhood when it was such fun to dress up and pretend on giove di grasso the thursday before lent a pesca di beneficenza is held in the piazza that is to say there is a sort of lottery with prizes given by various shops and public-spirited individuals the proceeds from the sale of tickets are divided among the various charitable institutions the fish caught are of the most diverse species bottles of wine wooden spoons and small cooking utensils have been won by the writer who fortunately never became the embarrassed possessor of a cow sometimes the highest price of the pesca a curious modern custom somewhat at variance with the spirit of the day is the performance of the band on the zatere during the afternoon of ash wednesday it is essentially a promenade of the people one sees whole families father mother children and children's nurse walking up and down on this sunny sheltered fondamenta enjoying the music and watching the shipping while other listening figures less prosperous and more picturesque sprawl contented on the steps of palaces and churches the washing of the feet of certain beggars by the patriarch in st mark's is an interesting ceremony on the morning of giove di santo maundy thursday but a far more impressive service is the tenebre followed by the miserere and a procession with the relics again as on christmas eve the nave is softly lit by the suspended cross of oil lamps but now the, the chancel is in gloom and blackness and as the solemn chanting continues the only points of light the tall white altar candles are extinguished one by one at last out of the gloom comes a strain of passionate contrition and the tension of mourning breaks like a sob in the appeal of the miserere then a procession sombre and purple winds through the church and back towards the pulpit to the right of the choir from which the patriarch after the relics have been solemnly exposed blesses the kneeling worshippers the procession of corpus domini in modern venice cannot compare either with its former self or with similar processions in other parts of italy notably in bologna its route is curtailed as much as possible and it barely appears outside the walls of st mark's we must stand before the picture of gentile bellini in the accademia to realise its sometime glory as it traversed the piazza in the golden june sunshine more characteristic is the simple corpus domini procession at morano repeated on the following sunday while that at borano rarely witnessed by foreigners is yet more primitive and spontaneous it takes place late in the afternoon for these poor fisher folk cannot afford to keep holiday at an early hour it makes the tour of the island and is composed of almost the entire population they are a fine race these buranei and buranelle and the children are delightful the trappings of the show may be worn and tawdry child angels may be vested in coarse lace curtains and the little saint john baptist wear a mangy sheepskin but the grace of childhood and the sweet dignity of adoring motherhood are as the old venetian painters saw and fixed them in picture after picture of the madonna and child and worshipping putini and always the atmosphere of the lagoons plays its tricks of transformation so that the procession filing across a bridge or spreading itself into a group about a temporary altar on the line of route becomes a picture never to be forgotten one of the very few processions now allowed to traverse the streets of venice takes place on june the thirteenth the day of san antonio it forms in the piazza about ten a m and is composed not only of the patriarchal canons and functionaries of san marco but also of the parochial clergy 
each wearing a different coloured stole, which gives the procession a curious striped effect. It passes to the church of the Salute, across a bridge of boats thrown over the Grand Canal, and appears, seen from the surrounding windows, as a streak of glowing colour with banners fluttering in the sea breeze. Once again in the year is the Salute approached by a pontoon, and visited in state by the Patriarch, the Canons of St. Mark's, and all the Parocchi of Venice. In 1631 the plague, which had raged for sixteen months in Venice and the adjacent islands, was suddenly arrested, whereupon the doge, council, senate, nobles and clergy went in solemn procession from St. Mark's to a wooden church hastily erected on a piece of land given to the Republic by the Knights Templars, and there offered the city's solemn thanks, given to Mary, the Mother of Health. In due time, Baldassare Longena, who obtained the order by open competition, erected the structure so audacious, yet so strangely graceful, which delights our eyes as we enter the Grand Canal. And year by year, on November the 21st, Venice renews its thanksgiving, and implores the continued protection to the Madonna della Salute. Most Venetians, even those not practising, non praticanti, as a rule visit the church that day, and very early in the morning dwellers in its vicinity are awakened by the tramp-tramp of feet on the wooden structure of the bridge. At the church door, the devout purchase tapers, light them, and pass them over the sanctuary rails to the sacristan, till the figure of the Madonna above the high altar is illuminated with thousands of flickering candles. His candle delivered and his prayer said, the average Venetian pays little further heed to the low or high mass at which he is nominally assisting. Presently he will move towards the door, and inspect the booths erected in the big open space round the church, where are sold rosaries and little statuettes of saints and pictures of the Madonna, as well as more mundane goods, such as galetti, made of flour, lard, and white egg, candied fruits, strung on straws, and other cheap dainties. The gondoliers of the traghetto of San Gregorio receive three francs apiece for the day, as a compensation for the loss suffered by them by the making of a footway across the canalazzo. Three times in the year is the canal thus bridged, on June the 13th, November the 21st, and the third Sunday in July. On this last occasion, however, the bridge to the Salute is merely an avenue to the far longer pontoon stretched across the wide canal of the Giudecca to the church of the Redentore. This is another votive church, built to commemorate the cessation of another plague. The Festa, from 1577 to the present day, has been an immensely popular one. The evening of the Redentore is talked about and saved for months beforehand. There are few families that do not manage to hire a boat, provide a supper, and spend the evening on the water. It is pleasant to see them seated round a table, placed in some large old barca, adorned with lanterns and green boughs, eating a frugal meal, and prolonging the enjoyment of their red wine. The crowd of boats of all descriptions is extraordinary and rather alarming. It is wise to take two gondoliers, and wonderful to watch the dexterity with which they steer their course and avoid accidents. Everyone is on pleasure bent, and infectious, and on the whole, harmless hilarity prevails. A band plays on the Giudecca, and fireworks, always entrancing in Venice, are let off at midnight. Then, if the night is fine, the Venetian rows out to the Lido, where he greets the rising sun and dips in the cool sun-kissed waves. A preceding chapter has dealt with the regattas, state entries, illuminations and serenatas of which the Canalazzo is the scene. But another sort of procession may sometimes be seen crossing it to cut into one or other of the canals which run eastward towards the Fondamente Nuove. None of the new and strange things seen in Venice have ever impressed me with this city's unlikeness to the mainland, so much as the spectacle of one of these funerals streaming out towards the island of San Michele, where the dead are laid to rest in the black ooze. 
whereas in other places the hearse is melancholy and the attendant carriages have little about them distinctively funereal in venice it is the long train of gondolas with their black felze rowed by gondoliers in black scarves and sashes which sounds the note of mourning while the bark bearing the coffin which is often heaped with flowers seems to bound forward almost with an air of triumph there are three grades of funerals at corresponding prices and one could wish that the first-class bark were not adorned with a golden lion of saint mark weeping into a golden handkerchief still if the decoration is ridiculous it is not lugubrious and the passage over the breezy space of the lagoon in brilliant sunshine or on one of those grey languid days when rest seems the summum bonum of human life conveys suggestions and impressions far different from those provoked by the slow progress to an english cemetery but the time intervening between a death and an interment in venice is peculiarly trying to the relatives of the deceased especially if they chance to be strangers in the land never does the red tape of italian bureaucracy appear more knotted and obnoxious sordid anxieties and irritations start up at every turn and all kinds of official obstacles hinder the accomplishment of formalities which yet may not be omitted without incurring legal penalties once a year on november the second the space of water which like a sanitary cordon parts the living from the dead is spanned by a bridge of boats similar to that which in high summer was constructed over the channel of the judecca all venice streams across it for few there are who have no relatives or friends in san michele and none who would leave them unvisited on the day dedicated to the departed as one nears the fondamente nuove a dull beating sound meets the ear persistent as a torrent but harsher and more irritating and when one emerges before the open space of the lagoon its cause is manifest it is the sound of hundreds of thickly shod feet upon the planks the march of the living to the dead near the entrance to the bridge are booths where flowers and tapers may be purchased and where little meringue-like biscuits called fave are sold they are variously flavoured and gaily coloured and are the confectioner's substitutes for the true beans which should be eaten by every devout venetian during the period of his lemuria the bridge is divided half for those who go half for those who return it almost makes one dizzy to watch the two black streams flowing in opposite directions few of the people make the pilgrimage by water though now and then i have seen a heavy boatload of black shawled women rowed perhaps by a couple of lads those who go by gondola must steer for the church that rises white against the black smoke of the murano furnaces and must alight at the steps near the steamer pontoon and rejoin their boat at the landing stage hard by the temporary bridge this is the order of the day and is strictly enforced after glancing in at the dark church where litanies are being chanted round a black draped catafalque one traverses the cemetery so different from an english burial ground with its cloisters and open squares filled now with a quiet crowd every unit of which seeks the resting place of some loved one out of blurred impressions of giorni dei morti spent in venice comes back the vivid recollection of two little lads struggling up a bank with a wreath of pink chrysanthemums bigger than themselves i gave them a helping hand and they told me that mother was ill and had sent them to lay the wreath on father's grave they were poorly dressed and looked underfed and i wondered what the flowers had cost there remains with me also an indelible picture the figure of a young woman with the rare titian red hair kneeling in the children's portion to the cemetery beside a little grave she held an infant in her arms and clutched it to her heart with streaming eyes as who should say I will not let this one go it had been a soft but sunless day and now the light was waning and the breeze freshening i saw her bent black shawled figure silhouetted against a saffron streak which separated the steel grey of the water from the pearl grey of the sky and all about her were the pale flickering flames of tapers burning on the graves 
fit emblems of the frailty of human lives. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Things Seen in Venice by Lonsdale and Laura Rag. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Varia The soul of a city, how distinctly it manifests itself to our spirit and our senses, yet how difficult it is to convey an impression of its intangible and impalpable essence. If we were to set down asleep in a street in Rome, Florence, Bologna, Milan, we should know to which city we had been transplanted before our eyes had been opened five minutes but if we were spirited to venice we should know it i think before we were well awake those who live long there even feel a subtle difference between the different sestieri of the city the stream of passengers across a bridge they always seem like walking figures on a stage the gestures of loiterers by a fruit stall the physiognomy of young mothers with infants in their arms or of children playing in seemingly dangerous proximity to a canal the arrangement even the odour of the shops are not quite the same in canareggio as in dorsoduro in san polo as in castello every campo has its own group of shops within it or in an adjacent calle which supplies the neighbourhood with all the necessaries of life and first as a social centre a place where a coterie of intimates drop in and talk and glance through the halfpenny paper of the day is the farmacia the chemist's it is usually a decidedly attractive place neat and bare with its few patent medicines locked away in cupboards and its shelves decorated with long rows of lovely faience jars some of them plain blue and white others decorated in delicate coloured designs they are more artistic symbols of the trade than rosamond's purple jar and are or were useful as well as ornamental nowadays however they are apt to stand empty partly because they are too valuable for daily handling collectors give high prices for them when they come into the market partly because dame fashion contrives to rule the physician almost as much as the dressmaker and the drugs which cured our forefathers are now demode thus the jar bearing as part of its design the name triaca must needs remain unfilled though the city was once famous for this compound manufactured publicly on a fixed day in the year with extraordinary solemnities we have it on bacon's authority that venice treacle was one of the few medicaments of his time which was mixed according to established and unvarying formulae two or three points about italian dispensing are worth noting no patent medicine may be sold unless its ingredients are published on the cover to every preparation sent out a label must be fixed on which the physician's prescription is transcribed powders are taken in wafers cialdi easily swallowed when wetted the taste of the medicament is disguised and it is more easily assimilated and cheaply dispensed than in pill or tabloid form the inexperienced foreigner is apt to think that the word drogeria painted over a shop is a synonym for chemist but if instead he see the word spezier or spezieri and there are not a few calli in venice called del spezier he will easily recognize its identity with the french epicier originally indeed the chemists famacisti and the droghieri or spezieri represented two branches of the same trade and formed a single confraternity but while the former were scattered over the city the dealers in spices and olive oil and manufacturers and retailers of sugar and candles abode chiefly in the streets between the church of san salvatore and the rialto bridge called after them spezieria and gradually the farmacisti and spezieri drew apart and formed two separate guilds retail trade to-day tends towards concentration rather than towards differentiation but in venice which lags behind the hurrying world beyond the lagoons old trade divisions are maintained only in the vicinity of st mark's is anything found approaching to the modern comprehensive grocery store and the confectioner baker and maker of pasta are three distinct entities 
the baker produces a pleasing variety of bread there is bread made with milk and with oil in dialect cologgio there are long loaves of coarse texture and standard hue little breads known as busalai or panne veneziano twisted into odd hard shapes powdery in texture white hard and unnourishing yet somehow very pleasant to soak in soup or coffee and in the better class shops there is panne francese made into the usual french shapes of roll and crescent and the long hard sticks so nice to nibble between the courses of luncheon or dinner which are called gressini and are the invention of the bakers of turin the antiquity dealers and their wares are great features of venice they are of various grades and pretensions and the best finds may often be made in the abodes of the humblest though the obscure man having no particular reputation to lose must be handled with caution of course the demand for genuine antiques far exceeds the supply and in consequence imitation has become a fine art moreover really old pieces of furniture are apt to be exceedingly rough compared with french and english work of the same date partly perhaps because the best specimens of the cabinet maker's craft remain in the palaces for which they were made or have long since been taken out of italy further what looks magnificent in the large spaces of an italian palazzo in sunlight glancing off the water and broken and reflected by marble architraves gilded beams and clouded venetian mirrors has quite a different effect in a moderate-sized english drawing-room beside chippendale and flowered chintz the rococo gilded consoles and settees and the painted cabinets and commodes with their delicate landscapes and gay figures and flowers are particularly ill-adapted for transplantation to northern climes i once heard of an english painter who revelling in the glorious colour and quaint designs of the sails of venetian fishing smacks took pains to purchase one and have it sent to london he hung it up on the wall of his studio he found it dead colourless and uninteresting this is a story with a moral for those who would take home curios from venice it must be owned however that to wander through an antiquario's room and examine and appraise its contents is a fascinating pursuit for a wet day but the inexperienced traveller would do well to secure the company of an italian friend at all events he should never trust to the chartered recommendation of his gondolier or be induced to pay half the price of goods which are to be shipped home a small sum may justly be demanded as capara or earnest money an evidence of good faith the price of any big purchase might be left with the english consul or with a respectable hotel keeper to be delivered as soon as notice is received of the arrival of the goods in england even the smartest milliners dressmakers and haberdashers trade under conditions which seem curiously difficult measured by modern standards of commercial comfort other cities have advanced venice is unchanged to evelyn and other travellers of bygone days the merceria seemed one of the gayest and sweetest streets in the world the twentieth century visitor admires its picturesque windings but finds its shops irritatingly dark and incommodious and certainly does not praise it for being exceedingly clean and paved with brick yet we can well believe that seventeenth-century venice must have been extraordinarily agreeable and sanitary compared with other cities of the epoch since no animals wandered about the streets and refuse instead of lying festering outside the houses was thrown into the canals and twice a day carried by the tide out to sea there is one advantage about venetian shops they have no sales a few articles may be marked occasione or a departing tradesman will put the placard liquidazione in his windows but the feverish excitement of london in january and june would accord ill with the venetian temperament great frugality in the matter of paper and cartons is practised newspaper is largely used for making parcels and the little girls they generally come in couples who bring home a hat are instructed to wait in the hall for the box a first-rate dressmaker sends a delicate gown enveloped not in soft paper but in a white wrapper 
and the porter waits for the wrapper and the box as well as for the expected mancia of twenty or thirty centesimi gloves are usually bought at the makers and are good and inexpensive anybody wanting a peculiar cut or shade of quality can have them made to his taste in this as in so much else italian and especially venetian retail trade harks back to ancient types akin to the guantiere or glove maker is the worker in leather all sorts of articles are made and books are elaborately bound in embossed coloured and gilded leather an industry peculiar to venice is represented in the bead shop which is a sort of by-product of the glass factory it is a strangely seductive place and whoever enters it feels impelled to purchase girdles and necklaces bags and hat-pins not to speak of strings of beads of many hues and shapes for home threading who wears the beads bought in venice is a dark mystery to me perhaps it is part of the bigger problem what becomes of things sold at bazaars for a bazaar at home is an excuse for much bead buying and much worrying of the anglo-american colony in venice i once knew a busy englishwoman who was asked by a slight acquaintance in england to send her a hundred hat-pins all different by return of post bead stringing is an occupation which augments the income of many a venetian woman it is not very lucrative but it demands little intelligence or skill and can be practised under agreeable conditions all through the summer visitors to venice are familiar with the sight of women seated outside their doors with trades of beads on their knees and in their hands the long pierced wires which so greatly facilitate the work of stringing a good deal of lace-making and embroidery is now done as homework the greater and better portion however is produced in lace schools attached to the large lace emporiums the long room with its lines of figures many of them graceful and girlish bending over frames is a scene worthy of an artist's studio venetian women in spite of painters encomiums are really far less beautiful than those of many other parts of italy notably than their near relatives in the hill country of the veneto but they carry themselves well and the mere absence of ugly hats and ill-fitting coats is an immense gain to their appearance and incidentally to that of streets and campi through which they move their heavy black fringed shawls are expensive to purchase but last for years and like the spanish mantilla lend grace and distinction to the wearer unlike the mantilla however they are not worn on the head save perhaps during a sudden storm summer and winter the woman of the venetian popolo goes uncovered on scorching days sheltering her well-dressed head with a parasol whether this custom proceeds from vanity or from economy and the beauty of venetian hair be a cause or an effect is a problem which from the nature of women cannot be satisfactorily determined certain it is that hairdressing is a fine art with them they perform the office of coiffeurs for each other and on special occasions seek professional skill but their belief that long hair is a glory induces habits contrary to the precepts of st paul they are devout in a certain careless fashion they rarely go out to their morning's work or marketing without entering a church and since the obligation of dressing in one's best for worship which is so inimical to weekday church-going with the english poor never enters the mind of an italian it follows that the venetian woman prays as she labours uncovered the habit is the more curious because in bygone days venetian maidens of all but the poorest families went veiled as in the east and the ideas of the popolino regarding the seclusion and subjection of women have still an eastern tinge those who are interested in the homes and customs and etiquette of the people are advised to read the chapter on home life in mr horatio brown's life on the lagoons even the casual visitor to venice if he hire a gondola by the week may see one venetian interior the gondolier is generally pleased to show his modest home his wife his mother and some pretty children and is especially proud of his neat bedroom 
with its whitewashed walls adorned only with some cheap coloured pictures of saints its walnut furniture and excellent wooden beds iron bedsteads are little accounted of in these circles but the visitors will probably wax more enthusiastic over the kitchen with its pretty flowered plates its really splendid secchie and other copper pans and brass utensils kept bright not with pernicious polishes but with sand lemon juice and a great deal of elbow grease these secchie are no longer to be found in every venetian kitchen for now that water from the aqueduct is laid on to all the larger houses big receptacles for fetching and keeping well water are no longer in demand the picturesque but unwholesome days when venice depended on springs that were generally brackish and when great skins of sweet water were rowed over the lagoon from the brenta and hawked through the streets are almost forgotten now that every palazzo and the well of every campo are supplied from the hill country near bassano with water delicious to the taste and cool in the hottest summer venice has good milk as well as good water the product of the pastures of the near mainland one large landowner has depots in several quarters of the city and his milk can be bought sterilized in sealed bottles meat is not very good and looks particularly untempting in a dark shop in a dirty calle happily the butchers always close at midday poultry is indifferent and dear especially when the bidding is against the purveyors to the big hotels but at certain seasons excellent wildfowl from the salt marshes can be obtained fish is as good as the days when madame piozzi mrs thrale praised it the adriatic is in this respect very unlike the mediterranean and there are several species peculiar to its upper reaches which have quaint names and nice flavours especially good are mullet trilia a fleshy fish called coda di rospo literally toad's tail and a kind of enlarged prawn called scampo scampi are usually served as a contorno garniture to other boiled fish the fish is always fresh the supply tends to be less than the demand and the best fish is not sent off by train as in english fishing towns nor is it kept on ice in fishmongers shops cook buys in the fish market or from some hawker who has himself been there betimes and sometimes after rough weather in lent a late comer will find the stalls as bare as mother hubbard's cupboard the picturesque little fish market in campiello pescaria of the riva degli schiavoni and the large one at the rialto are well worth a visit on a fine morning while the erberia fruit and vegetable quay in front of the old buildings of rialto should be seen late in the afternoon when the barges arrive from the mainland to deposit their green freights it is of course on account of this transport from afar and the dazio impost exacted on all foodstuffs brought into the city that fruit flowers and vegetables are less cheap and plentiful in venice than in other italian towns while of the things accounted necessaries of life corn wine and oil wine alone is cheap in venice oil is dear since it is imported from southern italy the climate of the veneto being too vigorous for olives the poorest classes buy bread very sparingly their farinaceous food chiefly takes the shape of polenta a solid porridge of maize flour turned out on one rounded wooden board and flattened with another which is eaten in great chunks hot or cold this polenta with a little fried fish or some strange mollusks and perhaps a salad form the working-day dinner of the gondolier his family and his social equals varied with rice and cabbage or with the risibisi a risotto made with peas in the evening there may be more polenta and soup or vegetables beans hot or cold with oil or vinegar or made into soup supply the greater portion of the poor man's proteids they are the product of the northern veneto and of excellent quality the same praise cannot be bestowed upon the wine save that produced in certain districts notably near conegliano in good years the rather sweet white wine when new 
is exceedingly pleasant and the englishman in venice drinks it readily but the venetian as a rule only likes red wine and red wine does not keep in venice only at the time of vintage is the red wine of the veneto the best comes from the neighbourhood of verona really good drinking then the pure fresh garnet coloured grape juice may be had for fifty or sixty centimes a litre and in exceptional years even for forty-five centimes but this autumnal superabundance of vino nostrano maketh sad the heart of man dwelling in the vicinity of a wine-shop for it leads to revelry by night the men of the venetian popolo are not tempted to solitary drinking even the best of wine in their opinion requires the additional flavour of conversation and each of them has his favourite osteria which serves him as a club there in a room with a stove comfortably stuffy after the cold of their own dwellings or in a vine-shaded yard dignified by the name of garden which is so much cooler than the stifling kitchen at home the little circle of habitues meet day after day and sip their wine drive bargains and discuss the affairs of the neighbourhood the immediate neighbourhood that is for the births deaths and marriages failures and successes of other quarters do not concern them they are foreign affairs about which no one can know much or feel strongly the habit of spirit drinking is unhappily growing favoured by the cold raw winter climate workmen going forth to the day's labours on a chilly morning are apt to fortify themselves with a bicchierino of grappa a kind of coarse brandy which at that early hour is so much more quickly easily and cheaply procured than hot coffee this practice cannot but undermine the constitution especially when no food is taken till the day is old the venetian is wonderfully indifferent as to the hour when he breaks his fast i have known gondoliers do a hard morning's work without touching food or drink in conclusion it might be well to say a few words about the climate and the health of the city of the lagoons the winters are perhaps colder than in england that is to say the cold is more continuous and one feels it greatly for there is less comfort within doors the gondola is not so warm as a broom rapid exercise can be got only at the lido and the draughty sunless stone paved calli are infinitely more chilly than a hedge-bordered road venice is spared the ice and snow of bologna though a snowfall occasionally occurs and the piercing dust-laden winds of florence but in december and january there is often fog and wild weather seawards which sends the gulls screaming up the canalazzo spring comes sooner and more certainly than on the northern side of the alps but dwellers in venice miss its sweet signals the bleating of lambs and the song of nesting birds the scent of violets the feeling of rising sap the surprise of opening buds summer is really uninterruptedly warm early in may winter clothes are put away with every precaution against the industrious moth and muslins and very thin tweeds or flannels become the only wear light overcoats and wraps should however be kept at hand for use during the chilly hours or days following a thunderstorm there are spells of uncomfortable heat which are the more trying because the difference between the night and day temperature in venice is very slight still one is well content to linger there till the festival of st james the apostle july the twenty fifth when according to venetian superstition and everybody's observation the swallows seek new quarters then san zaniere mosquito curtains must be put up for the departure of the birds who had preyed on them leaves the exasperating insects free to prey on venice and they fatten and multiply till autumn rains extinguish them mosquitoes are kept alive all the year in some of the hotels by excessive heating and a continual supply of fresh aliment in private apartments they are rarely seen or heard before july but for these pests and the prevalence of the exhausting shirocco wind september and october would be the pleasantest as they are certainly the loveliest months in the lagoon from questions constantly put to me i gather that there is a general impression in this country 
that venice is an extremely unhealthy city and in summer positively pestilential as a matter of fact it has less illness and a smaller death rate than most other towns of the same size and there is and can be nothing especially unwholesome about the summer months twice a day as we have already noticed the fresh sea-water flows in through the gates of the lidi twice a day it ebbs carrying with it the refuse of the city it does not cease to rise and fall and perform its beneficent operations in summer nor are there any stagnant fever-breeding waters near the city which at that season gains in salubrity by its emptiness the least wholesome time perhaps is spring because the enormous concourse of tourists tends to produce insanitary conditions moreover the grand canal the spot where they most do congregate is constantly churned up in a way uncontemplated by the old makers of venice as the penny steamers ply in rapid succession to take up passengers who await them in crowds upon every pontoon the smells of venice are however far less dangerous to health than the fritture of all kinds of little fish which are temptingly served in restaurants and sometimes appear in the cosmopolitan menu of fashionable hotels they are caught too near land to be safe eating and the tourist will do well to eschew them together with oysters salads of uncooked vegetables and strawberries grown on well manured lands and picked and packed by dirty fingers but the greatest risks run by visitors to venice are those of their own making the brilliant sun of an italian march or april tempts them to don the lightest summer garments and english girls appear in cotton gowns while venetians are still wrapped in furs then a gondola without covering is not the same as an open carriage damp provocative of rheumatic chills rises from the water and the italian sticks to the felze till summer has quite begun but the stranger objects to the felze he thinks it stuffy it is not so if the door be left open and it impedes his view the sudden chill of sunset so sensible and so deadly on the riviera and in southern italy is indeed not felt in venice but the anglo-saxon tourist who after a warm and tiring day emerges at night from the heated atmosphere of the hotel dining-room and goes forth in gondola without cover and with very insufficient overcoats and wraps certainly does his best to court sickness i can only add that if he succeeds in his wooing he will find very comfortable quarters in the english nursing home on the judecca end of chapter seven end of things seen in venice by lonsdale and laura rag read by phil benson in sydney australia